We have one week left until DerbyCon 2018. Let's break down security. I'm Brian, Mr. Batcher, Miss Berlin. Hello. Yay. It's awesome. I'm so excited. One week to Christmas time. I know. And actually, if you are going for training, you are leaving probably, what, Monday to come uh, to Soon, go down there. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, Tyler Hudak, uh, amongst others, are going to be uh, giving out training that week. It's awesome. So... <clears throat> Yeah, we've got a lot going on at DerbyCon. Like I said, it's like our Super Bowl. It's like, you know, Christmas and, you know, all birthdays and everything just all wrapped up into one. So, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, oh, of course, Miss Berlin's like, you know, one legged man in the ass kicking contest over here. <laughs> She's, you know, busy as all hell. Yeah, I'll be, I'll, I'm heading down Wednesday. Um, I have to, st- I have uh, one hotel on the other side of the river, like in Indiana, Wednesday night, and then I'm moving to the Marriott. No, sorry, to the Hyatt. Why? Uh, because so I don't have my kids Wednesday and Thursday. Oh, no, Tuesday and Wednesday already. Mm-hmm. So I figured I'll just go down a day earlier. Okay. All um, right. Than what I had originally planned. Right. Just to see. Well, that's good, and, you, and then you can set up. Do you have toadies yep. that are going to help you set up? Um. Yeah, I have a lot of people that have offered to set up, and I hope some of them show up. I'm, um, I'm sorry. I don't mean my, to call them toadies, but you know, we, my biggest worry right now is if everything's going to actually fit in my rental. Oh, um, my living room and my front porch currently look like an Amazon distribution center. <laughs> Would you rent a like a Nissan Leaf or something? Uh, no, I got an SUV, <laughs> but I boy, do I have a lot of boxes. Oh, really? Well, I heard yeah. the Nissan Leafs are like the TARDIS, man. They're really, really large on the inside. Really? Yeah. You have to like strap stuff to the top that's that's probably going to happen you know um <clears throat> you might want to try packing things in and then saying oh crap i need a u-haul trailer on the back of it i hope or not. invest in bungee cords ah yeah. bungee cords i have like i have straps and stuff that i could probably use but i really don't have i don't want to have to do that yeah well, yeah, you've got so, all the mental health stuff for the workshop there, and then I have all the break sex stuff. I well, you know, and like I need to bring clothes. What? <laughs> so there's that. That's true. Yeah, you can't just um, walk around with two shirts on, you know. So, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I have boy, do I have a lot of stuff. Yeah. Well, I'll be able to take some of that home. I'm going to bring an extra couple bags, maybe check a bag or two. Them. Um, well, bring... we should be able to get rid of. I'd imagine most of the shirts. True. That's true. Uh, the stickers don't take up much room. I did bag all of our special like giveaway stuff the right. other day. I had a little assembly line going in my kitchen table, my dining room table. Right. The brownies with oregano in them is going to be uh, right. big sellers. Right. Big sellers. <laughs> right. We got we got a lot. Go- so Mr. Betcher uh, and Mr. Goff through the Breaking Down Incident Response podcast and LogMD are going to do a vendor table, and I'm going to be babysitting it. Uh, somewhat um, and being a booth booth person I can't call it booth babes anymore I'm going to be a booth person um, ask, answering so, questions yeah everybody will know where to find you uh, we'll be on the second floor um, near the bathrooms I guess so we'll get a lot of traffic that way oh those bathrooms are but nice also, yeah. oh yeah they're very nice they're very nice bathrooms and uh, it, it's kind of like near the um near the way to the Hyatt. Oh, oh. by the tunnel right. there. Okay. Okay. The tunnel. Yes. Right. I've taken Perfect that before. Placement. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I love that cuz um I, you know, we've we've talked how awesome the bathrooms are. I, I you know, that's one reason we're you're moving to the Marriott, so that's cool. Um <clears throat> do you know where the location of the mental health uh room is? It is in Bluegrass 1 and 2. Okay. Which I don't know where it is. Oh. <laughs> I just know that's the name of the room. Okay. Uh, they gave us 1,600 square feet. Nice. That's so almost half, as big as my house. Yeah. Half of the room is going to be set up like um, classroom style for the talks. Mm-hmm. And then the other half of the room will be the massages. And um, have, have you ever seen those... It's like a lounger kind of, uh, it's like a big tube of air. Like you open it up and you whoosh it through the air and then close it. And then it's like this air filled seat that you can sit on. Huh. Okay. So Never I got a it. bunch of those and I hope they work because wow. I feel like that could just be like a cool, like you lounge and do things nice. in there. Nice. But we should have room for those and okay. tables of <clears throat> other things that we're doing. 
Do you have the oh. Eventbrite link for the break sec pizza party? Oh, I oh I dropped oh. a secret. Oh, that's the yeah. other thing we're doing. Yep. So the the the, yes. the where the mental health workshop is. Uh, so bluegrass one and two is also where the break sec uh, people are going to be having our pizza party, and you can RSVP to Eventbrite. I warn you, there's already fifty people coming, so have already signed up because we told everybody on our Slack ahead of time. So if you're interested in joining that. And, gonna, and when we say we told everybody in the Slack, we told everybody. She heard people on Slack. I, I, no, what did I do? At channel or at everyone? Oh, you, I think you at channeled, which we yeah, don't normally allow channel. that, but uh, yeah. we it's, broke it's protocol. It's a very powerful feeling yes. to do an at channel to like 2,000 people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's not <laughs> because good. Because it warns you. There are like, this is what? We have set. 1,400, 1,500 in there or something. Yeah, you're going to notify 1,500 and people in 48 in, time zones in or like whatever. In 20 time zones. Yeah. Are you really sure that you want to do this? Oh, yeah, yeah I am. Heck yeah. <laughs> I wish it Ping. gave people that warning um, in Outlook whenever somebody sends a company-wide email. Oh, and yeah. that would be awesome. You're yeah. about to send this to 4,000 people. Do you want to do that? That is a really Maybe. good idea. Yeah. I, I will put the uh, meetup link in the show notes as yeah. well <clears throat> so we're gonna have pizza i don't know if we're gonna do it at the same place we did last year we may just try to find like a, a domino's or a papa john's or a little caesar's or something i don't know man that pizza was really good last year uh, i know but my, i got so nervous waiting for them to show up and it's gonna be even bigger than it was last year and i'm really worried about them being able to deliver on time and have you called them yet no i mean they can bring on an extra employee or two just for that I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that chicken and waffle was pretty good. <sighs> it was. God, I know it was. Shit. Uh, I would say let's give them a phone <clears throat> call. And, say, All and right. for the people that keep on asking, um, if you uh, if you would like to add money in for buying pizza, that is fantastic. Tips are you can accepted. Either, you know, sign up to be a Patreon or bring Ooh. 10 bucks or whatever. Yeah. I guess either way. That would be great. Uh, it's not required, but it would help us not yeah. have to pay out of Brian's pocket. <laughs> what? What? I melted the card last year. It came out of my own pocket. I didn't. I didn't have like real money. So yeah. Um, no, anyway, I'll be I'll be chipping in too. So cool. So Any, anybody else wants to help, that'd be great. Yep. And um, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, we're gonna be doing a lot at DerbyCon. We're gonna have the table. You can come by and talk to us about, you know, logging applications with LogMD or just shoot the shit with us about, well, there's our explicit tag, about the podcast. Um, we're going to probably at the pizza party do a break sec only podcast in addition to our, you know, annual podcast with podcasters. So it's going to be a lot of recording. Wait, we're going to have us. a live audience? We have 50 people. And as long as what? we lock the doors, if we block all the exits, then we'll have a captive audience. So that'll be nice. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. You know, it's like I'll ask, I'll ask Carl for the key. Ho it's Hotel California of podcasts. You know, you can come in, but you can't leave. You know, <laughs> right. so yeah, but you can eat. Yeah, you can eat, but you can't leave. Yeah, so um, we do actually have stuff to talk about. Um, do we? Yeah, really? I mean, other than my Model Three, I got. Thank you, Patreon. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Patreon people didn't pay for the podcast. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> there's people out there going i feel no, gypped people people out there man that's not cool that's not cool man <laughs> no no I'm, I'm just kidding i paid for that out of my own pocket as well <laughs> i've got my model three today it's so sweet it's so awesome anyway um <clears throat> so we do have some uh this isn't a news story um uh, i found this on twitter and i followed this gentleman he goes by the handle of uh, i'll have to was it Nik nikita uh, Kriznap. Um, <laughs> great. Nikita Tonsky. That's what. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Let me, uh, let me get it. Let me get it up. Uh, it's Nikki Tonsky. So N I K I T O N S K Y. Nick. Nikki Tonsky, yeah, that's it. Yes. Uh, lives in Russia. Uh, Novo. Oh God, Novosibirsk. <laughs> that's close. Novosibirsk. Novosibirsk. Okay. I don't know enough to correct you. So, all right. <clears throat> yeah. 
a full stack uh, software engineer, but he blogged about this thing. And it was, it was very interesting because he was talking about something that I've always wondered about myself. And it was, it soft, he, he calls it software disenfranchise, uh, disenchantment. That's what it's not, <laughs> disenfranchisement. Um, he's, he says he's been programming for 15 years. And uh, he said, recently, our industry's lack of care for efficiency, simplicity, and excellence started getting to him. And I have to, I have to kind of agree with that because I've noticed that um, I don't know if it's because of the Apple ecosystem or whatever, or and, but I, I use Android, but it seems like every operating system gets larger and larger, and it really doesn't add any additional functionality. Uh, in, in my opinion, um, <clears throat> I could say the operating systems do, but maybe the applications themselves don't. Right, right. And and uh, Nikita, uh, which is what he calls himself on on the ch- on the 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 blog post, says that you know uh, Windows ninety five can be ran in a browser with thirty megs of space, and the Android keyboard app is a hundred and fifty megs. <clears throat> which means a simple keyboard app on a phone is five times as large as an entire operating system. Uh, I'll be at a fairly dated operating system, but it's but still, still, yeah, exactly. Like, functionality wise. That's ridiculous. Right. And he said, okay, the windows 95 OS was 30 megs. Windows 10 is four gigs. Now, um, if you pull out bare functionality, there's not really much difference in, you know, what they do. Um, why, why does it take four gigs of, you know, to run an OS versus what, what took 30 megs back in the day? So it's all drivers. Is it drivers? No. Oh, okay. (laughs) Mr. Batcher, what do you think? Cause you're, you're a filthy developer now. I apologize to all the developers out there. I feel this guy's pain because I mean, that's, that's the reason I, I know C so well. I learned C um, a long time ago, I guess, in college. And then then we had to, I guess the whole school was transitioning into Java. Right. I just hated Java because it was so slow. And there was this whole web thing that, that, I, that I wasn't sure about. And you had garbage collection, which means you didn't really have to, you know, clean up after yourself. So you could just be a slob. Right. As a programmer. That's what it kind of meant to me. Like, um you 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 don't even need to clean up the memory that you use you just rely on another piece of the whole java environment to do that for you and it seemed really efficient inefficient to me and and they kept saying well the garbage collector is going to run whenever so your program could slow down while the garbage collector is running and all that and i just i just said screw java and i i stuck with c the whole time and and I'm glad I did because you know, LogMD is written in C and, and the size of it, it does a lot of stuff and it's two meg. So, and it's, and it's a standalone. It doesn't rely on any external libraries and things. So it pulls all those libraries in as part of the two meg, including all the windows things that it, that it uses. So, um, so yeah, when you, when you have a keyboard app that's that big, it's, it's just, ridiculous and i have no idea why it's that big okay so maybe you're pulling in so much code that you don't even use you probably i mean it would seem like you would use one percent of that code right that was and like nine percent is there just in case right yeah so like i don't really code much like i have like three things on my github like that's as much as i've ever done but one of the first things that i was taught and i've never taken actual programming classes or anything either is to never pull in full libraries and just pull in the functions and stuff that you actually need right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like does that contribute to a lot of size right when you pull stuff in like that i think in c it only pulls in the things that you use so you can you can import a library but yeah. once the program compiles, it only takes in those libraries that you need. Now, Windows uses dynamic libraries, so you can you don't have to pull those in. They're dynamic. But if you want a static um, program, you have to pull them in. But it only pulls in the ones that you could use, right. you know, that branch into those functions. Okay. Right? And, and I don't know much about, say javascript or anything to know if 
or any of these other languages like Python to know what it pulls in. Right. But I'm, I'm thinking that Docker was built specifically for um, the requirements that some obscure Python apps take. And, and nobody can compile some of these Python apps because they have all these benign external libraries that nobody can find. And, and you're like, well, I installed Python. What's what else do I need to do? Well, you need these libraries from GitHub or wherever, and, and you need to install them to get this program to work. Uh, just put it in a Docker image and then I don't have to worry about it. Right. So it's, it's very confusing for, uh, for new programmers or especially old programmers like me to be able to, to have to try and figure this out. Right. right? And then you throw up your hand, screw it. I'm writing it in C. Yep. <laughs> well, he, he calls that out. He's like, uh, what's worse is that, you know, nobody has time to figure out and stop and figure out what happened. He's like, you can just buy your way out of it. If it takes you 70 Amazon instances to run your distributed application and, oh, it's actually going to take a 71. Okay, great. You can just buy your way out of that. Add more resources. <clears throat> you know, um, you're going to just, you know, continue adding new things. There's no reason to go back and refactor. You're just going to continue adding more things. He says, this is not engineering. It's just lazy programming. Engineering is understanding performance structure, limits of what you build deeply, writing poor written stuff with more, combining poorly written stuff with more poorly written stuff goes strictly against that. And he says that we're stuck with it. He's not, he doesn't have a lot of positives in this, in this blog post. He says it's just going to continue getting worse and worse and worse and more bloated and more bloated. Um, it's definitely a good rant. Oh yeah. I mean, and he's definitely had, like, he's got no bad points. <clears throat> no, it's, it's all true. And, and this comes from a, a security background too. Cause you know, we've talked on the show about, uh, you know, library dependencies and library hell and, um, you know, supply chain security when you're dealing with things like CMSs, but it also deals with software libraries. Um, when I was, I was actually teaching the SysP, uh, bootcamp up here for the ISSA or, or not ISSA. Yeah, ISSA group. And we were talking about some of the dependencies, uh, dependency hell that, that goes on with that. And, you know, there are certain compliance frameworks out there or uh, certain, com you know, requirements for software development and building like FIPS, <clears throat> which I think is somewhat nonsense. But one of the things in FIPS is that you have to document every library that's being used when you're compiling things. And uh, for things like OpenSSL or OpenSSH, and if you had to you know, document the libraries or, you know, imports that you're doing in your code when you're building something simple like a web application, you would probably go insane if you had to document all those dependencies. <clears throat> and, yeah. and that's not including things like when you're adding, you know, pip or you're adding easy install or, you know, because he's got the, the XKCD comic down here about all the different ways of, you know, running package managers like NM NPM if you're running on JavaScript or um, <clears throat> Homebrew or, uh, you know, all the different versions of Python you have to install because something runs on 2.6 and not 2.7 or something runs in Python 3 and then there's another one that runs Python 2.7. So, <clears throat> you know, there's a number of different frameworks out there and it's it, you get stuck in framework hell, you get stuck in library hell. So he's, he's talking about all kinds of stuff like that. And so... Uh in Firefox, I have a tab that's got Slack on it, right? The Breaksec right. Slack channel. Mm -hmm. It's taking up 300, just that one tab, 311 megabytes. But that's memory. It's texting application. Sure. There's Giphy, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I have the app. I have the Slack app. Me um, too, yeah. And it is, let me see how big the app is itself. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Click on the link. There you go. Applications. Actually, just as an example, I can I can go through a number of things here. So Microsoft Word, Microsoft Word for Office uh, on the Mac, 2016, 2.2 gigs. 2.2 gigs for a word processor, by the way. Um, VMware Fusion, 830 megs. It's not awful. But, I mean, something that runs entire operating systems is roughly uh, a third the size of a word processor. You know, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> it, it, you know, it, it doesn't get any better. I mean... Well, you know, <clears throat> Excel 2010, yeah. nobody's... I mean, people may have said that it was sort of bloated. Right. But nobody... 
realize that there was an entire flight simulator inside Excel. I believe it was 2010. Really? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah well, there was a, that was an Easter egg, a really famous oh. Easter egg in Excel. Has it been gotten rid of? Uh, I'm Flight. sure Microsoft wasn't too happy about it when they found out. <laughs> Simulator, Windows, <laughs> Office 20. Uh, he's checking me. <laughs> no, I'm just wondering if it's in like Office 2016. Uh, list of Easter eggs in Microsoft products. Oh, yeah, I'll be damned. <clears throat> So but like regarding all the Chrome, all the XP. Chrome stuff, I mean, I've had, um, it's called the great suspender. Uh, Mick, Mick Douglas actually like turned me on yep. to it. It'll yep. actually pause all the tabs you're not using unless you whitelist them and tell it not to. Right. Um, it'll pause all the tabs you're using, you know, because I'm, I'm a frequent offender of having, you know, three to four Chrome windows open and like 10 to 30 tabs a piece. <laughs> Right, <laughs> which will bring my Mac to its knees, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, having having that's helped a lot. But I mean, to his point, like you probably shouldn't even need that right. if it was, you know, <clears throat> put together correctly. Yeah. So I mean, what what? So he doesn't have a, a good method by which you can fix it. He said that. Everything's just barely working pile of code added on top to barely written pile of code. Keeps growing in size and complexity, diminishing diminishing any chance for a change. Um, I mean, what do we what do we do to fix it? Is it something where we have to go in and you know we keep talking about moving security to the left, but dependency hell you know is is killing us and it's going to cause us issues with libraries that aren't being updated. Uh, you know, <clears throat> having to document these things should should we have documentation initiatives where we're you know having the developers go back and actually doing proper documentation of the libraries that are being used? I'm not sure you can fix it. I mean, because <clears throat> it's so easy for a programmer to say, "Well, I don't know what I'm going to need, but I'm just going to grab everything just in case." Yeah, right. So I don't have to worry about all these dependencies, and then your compiler or whatever you're using puts everything in there. Right. I mean. There are, I think one of the first things he mentions is web pages are bigger than Windows okay. 95 was. Just a, a web page. Mm -hmm. right? and, and, and I'm tired of all these uh, trackers and, and ads and things like that. When I get a pop-up that says, hey, I noticed you're using an ad blocker. Um, well, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, because you're trying to load you know, 130 JavaScripts on yeah. my web page. Yeah. <clears throat> That's why. Or a flash ad or something like that. Yeah. And half of them go to terrible threat listed IP addresses that are infecting you with crap anyways. Right. And they're daisy chain. One, one script may call another script and then yep. that calls another and that one calls another. They just load each other and it's this big virus, right? Yep. It, it's an STD on the web. You know, you <laughs> don't know who you're touching, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so I have, a, I have a question to all the InfoSec people out there that are in development environments. What are you, do, do you even worry about this stuff or is there other things that you need to worry about? Or do you have developer people that are, you know, needing, you know, do you wonder about software and library bloat? I mean, so, you know, let us know, hit us up on Twitter or, you know, send us an email, let us know. We'll, we'll add some feedback. Oh yeah. I got something. I got a correction at the end. I got to talk about anyway. So <clears throat> one um, of his questions is, um, ever wonder why your phone needs 30 to 60 seconds to boot? Why can't it boot in one second? There's no physical limitations to that. Right. Right. Uh, computers are so fast now. I, I looked at the uh, Microsoft um, Windows 95 system requirements. Mm -hmm. 25 megahertz. Now, that's not gigahertz. <clears throat> that's megahertz. That's processor you speed. Processor speed you right. need. And, and 40 megabytes of hard drive space. Yeah. I had a friend of mine um, in high school. He was running Windows 95 on like a 386DX66 or something like that. It was just ungodly, ungodly small. <clears throat> I mean, and I, we look at we look at things like Alpine Linux these days. And we're like, oh, it's so small and, and you know it's so compact and it still does everything it needs to do. That's why I don't use like 
you know, GNOME or, you know, KDE for desktops or something. It adds a gig and a half of space, you know, needed to a, to a VM and a lot of extra overhead that I don't enjoy using. So <clears throat> call me old fashioned, but I don't, I don't use GNOME. I don't use any KDEs. I use XFCE or I'll use, you know, God forbid command line. Weird. Um, <clears throat> or a tiling manager like Rat Poison or something like that. Cause I'm old school like that. So <clears throat> I got something caught in my throat, but to do a full-size cough is going to, you know, be really, really <laughs> awful. So. What the mute button's for? Uh, well, my setup doesn't work like that, so. All right, well, I think we've beat this to death. Um, if you are an InfoSec person, you can, you know, please email us or tell us why, you know, this is never going to work or why we're old and when this is, you know, why it's broken. Or if you're a developer and you know developers, you know, ask them why they have to, you know, grab every library under the sun to make sure their stuff compiles. So, um, <clears throat> so interesting, uh, little bit here. Uh, Oh, Oh, somebody's adding links from hacker her, some guy named hacker hurricane. Um, anyway, so there's, um, there's some living off the land here with malware. Uh, this is actually a news article, uh, gbhackers.com hackers abusing windows management interface command tool to deliver malware that steals account email account passwords. Um, Mr. Betcher uh, knew and knows a little bit about what WMI does and uh, WMIC and some of this attack. Um, <clears throat> maybe you could uh, discuss it, Mr. Betcher. Well, I can discuss WMI. It's, <clears throat> uh, it's one of those topics that we, we hear about what's yesterday's solution or is today's problem, right? Right. Um, it, it was used to uh, manage uh, systems or that that was the idea. So it could do pretty much anything, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And so, of course, attackers are going to use this stuff as they did with PowerShell, right? PowerShell was the be-all, end-all management of today, and, and now it's become a hacker's paradise. Right? Mm -hmm. The difference is that <laughs> With PowerShell logging, um, security people can now detect whenever an attacker is using PowerShell pretty easily. Uh, with WMI, not so much the case. It's a lot quieter. So you start getting WMI attacks. Those are the slick and stealthy ones. PowerShell right. ones are kind of like even the, the red teamers at DerbyCon, two, three years ago, they were going, yeah, PowerShell is legit. And now... Yeah, if you're using PowerShell, it's not not really that great. You should not do that anymore. You should go to other things. Um, and and they're coming up, and I'm sure there will be talks at DerbyCon about the latest um, attacks that are not using PowerShell that are being used in the red team community. So I'm really looking forward to hearing those talks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we've done a lot of research, Michael and I, with WMI. Um, and, and we have podcasts on it and have a guest to talk about WMI as well, WMI attacks. Um, I haven't dove into this particular one, uh, that they talk about in the article. It is a short article. Yeah. Um, but they do use, um, some obfuscation there. Yeah. According to, according to the attack, <clears throat> attackers are sending people a shortcut file through a URL or a link in an email or as an attachment. And it, it, it's kind of like a step-by-step a, a -step thing. So they download the LNK, which is a URL. <clears throat> the file downloaded... <clears throat> Sorry, apologies. Downloaded from the remote server is a malicious uh, XSL file. So XSLs are spreadsheets for XML files. Uh, you know, they they help uh, format if you're going to show an XML file in the browser how different tags in the XML file are rendered in the browser. So it's like a style sheet, cascading style sheet to the nth degree. So um, you know, XML's formatted data. Um, you can say, okay, I want, you know, the, the tag, um, you know, bugs or date time group to be formatted in a specific way. And the XSL tells you how to do that. So inside the XSL file is some malicious JavaScript that gets ran, um, when the MSHTA, um, application is ran in Microsoft. So that's the HTML host application. And according to MITRE... Uh, it executes 
uh, HTML applications, so the HTA files, which Mr. Betcher will tell us about here in a second, are standalone applications that execute using same modules and technologies of Internet Explorer, but outside the browser. So it's like a, a web browser or a web, uh, a, a web page outside of the browser. So it's a browserless web page. And there's several examples of that. Uh, Fin7 uh, uses it. Uh, Muddy Waters used uh, this to execute uh, its own payloads. So um, HTA files are nothing new to you then, Mr. Petcher. No, um, we've known about these for quite some time. Uh, Microsoft has a uh, hypertext rendering executable mm -hmm. that it that it uses besides Internet Explorer and that. So um, it doesn't need a browser to render these types of files. Um, it, the file extension SHTA, you should be blocking, whether it's in your IDS or IPS, you should be uh, blocking and alerting on that, and uh, email, and also your file extensions. So I put a link in the show notes on that and other file extensions that should be, yeah, you should not be allowing these in your environment. Ms. Berlin, you said that you warn your own customers to block these as well. Oh yeah, I have like a giant list of all the uh, all the uh, attachment types that they should block. Um, not only like at the firewall, but in their email filtering or whatever too. I mean, it's better if they just block all attachments and only allow the ones that they're supposed to let through or want to let through. Mm. Um, but, but yeah, like HTA is up there at being pretty bad. But I'm a customer. I want to be able to get all the files that I need because I have a legit reason for those. Is there a legit reason to have HTA files uh, being executed on the site? Well, if you get ransomware, typically they'll <laughs> execute an HTA uh, right. to show you how to, well, well that your system has been infected with ransomware, high, high encryption, you can't break it. And here's what you do to pay us. Right. Right. That's usually an HTA file there. Really? Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, would it, is it enough to block it or is there, should you modify, could you modify um, the mshta.exe to not run? Could you change it so that it, you know, has different permissions or is not executable anymore? Yeah. So as a stopgap, when all else fails, let's say they load the HTA from a USB drive or something, um, you should, yeah, this is highly recommended, um, deny the double click by changing the file extensions on all your systems. Okay. Right? And by doing that, you can change the file extension default to open it up in notepad or something right. benign. So if someone double clicks an HTA file uh, that they got in an email or, or something, then, well, well, let's say you are blocking it in your email gateway. Well, what if somebody opens up Gmail or some other, uh, some other app? Yep. Right, they get the file somehow. Then they they want to double click it. Well, you if you do change the file association, you denied them the execution of that HTA. I see. Okay. And part, part of uh, part of the training that I did through the podcast actually walks through how to change file associations using group policy. Okay. So you can push this out to your entire uh, organization instead of yep. having to, you know, walk Good. walk anybody through on how to change file associations. <clears throat> yeah, and like what the the benefit of group policy is you can do it based on groups of users or computers or whatever. So if you do have somebody that for some reason works with HTA files, they they can open them, but the rest of everybody else can't. Right. So those are those are for like um HTA files would be um like help files, right? Do, does Microsoft help use HTA files? I don't know. I'm just asking the question. If you I guys don't, don't know. know either, we can always, you know, punt. Yeah, no idea. Okay. <clears throat> anyway. Um, it's so more commonly used for malware, I'm sure, nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never, I've, I've not yet um, in the last, I don't know, three, four years run into it uh, being used legitimately. But see, all the modern, uh, well, Windows 10, the modern operating right. system has to be backwards compatible. Right. right. So that's why that's why, again, that's why it is bloated 
the way that it is because you can run apps that are stupid old. I mean, Windows has been talking about getting rid of WMI, right? but really they can't because there are a lot of apps, modern day apps that rely on it because they built it and it was so easy and had a lot of functionality to it. A lot of programs use WMI that you don't even know um, know about. Right. <clears throat> so for those of you out there who are screaming at the podcast, uh, Microsoft's help files are called CHMs, which are compiled HTML help files. Um, <clears throat> another proprietary format, but you could technically send a CHM file and that would open up in a, in a browser like help and probably, you know, run JavaScript as well. So that's an, you know, CHM files are probably something that you couldn't make open in notepad without screwing up the help, you know, associations. I mean, who really uses windows help anyways? I, I raised my hand. I'm, yeah. I, I, I <laughs> this, have is one. Not, this is not a video podcast. I'm sorry. The other than mine. Thank I, God. Thank God it's not a video podcast. I have one from time to time. I hit F1. Um, yeah, no, I I don't think I, I feel bad for the folks at Microsoft who make all these help documentation that nobody uses it. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I can understand why people don't spend time doing documentation because nobody ever reads it. So, um, <clears throat> I don't have anything else to talk about on that. So make sure you block HTA. Um, there's, um, there's probably somebody has, uh, you know, a nice compiled list of a attachments that you probably should block I or have, have open. A list I could probably add in the um, show notes. Okay. Uh, I'm sure Can Mr. Hurricane it? has them as well. Mr. Goff has a has a list as well. So, um, Miss Miss Berlin's is is much helpful uh, if you want that one as well. So, um, <clears throat> this is a this is an example though of living off the land, right? Because uh, malware attackers are using applications that are native to Windows and therefore wouldn't necessarily light off to endpoint security solutions oh somebody's using mshta.exe that's a legit you know windows binary so we're gonna let that happen you know that's live that's the living off the land example right uh just to, uh, suppose. Just to say uh chm is in the list that i have oh really hmm. yeah i Get suppose it is but the um the attackers still have to get uh, in this example I don't know where living off the land came from, but uh, they still have to get their code onto the system. Right. But somebody's going to click a link, you know, and it's going to yeah. download that and run the MSHTA or whatever. Um, once they've I gotten that. I think living off the land is more, okay, the, ha the attacker has creds. He's on the system. What does he do without executing a binary? Uh, what does he do without downloading a payload? Right, right. That that kind of living off the land, and and I'm sure there there are talks because I've heard I've heard this before and, and uh, <clears throat> right. yeah at conferences. Okay. Uh, so you've got oh wow she's got a whole mess of them. <laughs> There's a lot of them. DER executables, FXP, Fox Pro compiled source, dot gadget. Nobody should be using those dot gadgets. That's why they got rid of them in Windows Vista. <laughs> I thought they were really great. Nobody and should be running Vista anymore. I I liked the like the little gadgets you had you could put on the desktop, nope, but apparently they're completely not. ownable. So I was like, ah oh, man, that sucks. Yep. They had they had to go and make it all mean and stuff. INF files, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, IIS communication settings dot INS. Yeah, that's that's not a good one either. JavaScript. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's a no brainer. Come on, screensaver. <laughs> okay, so all right, so you've got KSH in there, Unix shell script. That's that's becoming a thing now because Windows 10 has the Linux subsystem. If you click on a link with a dot KSH yep. file in a in an email, that could conceivably run in you know, in the Linux subsystem, right? Yep. Okay. So you've added that one just recently, I'd imagine? Um, yeah. I mean, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't too long ago. Right. Okay. Last year or something. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I like the Linux subsystem on Windows, but yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely a uh, new vector 
because everything runs. E- I can run apt get in my Linux subsystem, and it's it's just basically Ubuntu in a container. I don't know if it's container format, but it's definitely a full fledged thing. I can run Metasploit inside my Linux subsystem on on my Windows ten box. It's pretty awesome. So, um, is that my Windows took thirty minutes to uh, update. Uh, well, you know, my Windows 10, I actually like my Windows 10 on my Surface Book. It doesn't, the, the, it's the updates, they don't take forever so much anymore. It used to, they used to take a lot longer, but anyway. Um, I don't, I don't have anything else, and I think we've probably talked over long. Um, besides, I need to, you know, start packing for DerbyCon on. Thursday. I fly in on Thursday, so I'll be there at like 5.30. So if anybody wants to have dinner with me on Thursday, you know, my your treat, you can, uh, you know, hook up and we'll go over to Gordon Beers or something. Yeah, I'll, I'll be down there. Uh, I think I have to set up starting at like 6 or 7. In the evening on Thursday? Uh, on right. Thursday, yeah. Oh, okay. Because uh, well, that's when training gets let out. Okay. So whenever training gets let out is when I'll start setting up. Um right. Well, I'll come find you and help you set up, and then we can go get some late night or something. Right on. There you go. All right. So um, before we go, I have a, uh, a correction. I obviously nope. misspoke uh, on the Windows event uh, framework uh, podcast. So one of our slackers, his name's Matt. The, for- the Windows event forwarding? That yeah. One? I'm sorry, event oh. forwarding. Right, 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 right. Um, <clears throat> he said, listen to the podcast tonight. You all discussed WEF. And I think there was slight inaccuracy when discussing EVTX <laughs> logs. Someone suggested they could be grepped since they're XML. Not entirely true because they're binary encoded. So you need a tool that can decode them first. Some sims have tools that can do this for you. Splunk, universal forwarders installed in Windows, WinLog, B, etc. And yep. Google says there's some other tools available for a number of other uh, a number of other tools like Python Dash, EVTX, or PowerShell. Hopefully this hasn't been discussed. I didn't see it on Slack or Twitter. So I was like, ah, good catch. My bad. I probably was the one who said that. So apologize to Matt. Thank you for uh, for setting me straight. I don't, you know, I don't. I'm I'm ignorant about WEF and. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we, I've seen them. <clears throat> I've seen them be pulled into like different log management stuff, right? And looked through and like queried. I'm I'm assuming there has to be some way to also grep through it. Right. It could be decoded. Once right. you've decoded them, I would assume they could be grepped. Right. Yeah. So that's uh, that's cool. Thank you for our listener for caring enough to set me straight. So I appreciate that. So um, <clears throat> so we're going to be, like I said, at DerbyCon. Uh, please find us. We'll have a we have a chat uh, channel on our um, BreakSec podcast Slack, which you can uh, DM and join us uh, by DMing us on Twitter at BreakSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. Or you can send an email to bds.podcast at gmail.com. Uh, that gets my Twitter stuff out of the way there. Uh, there's also a DerbyCon Slack. So uh, Dave and them at over at um, um, Trusted Sec set up their own Slack. So derbycon.slack.com if you want to get involved with that. It's probably going to be getting ramped up a lot sooner. Uh, they they have a bot that in, invites people. But if you're going to DerbyCon or you just want to you know lurk and see what everyone's doing, uh, derbycon.slack.com is, is also available. So... Ms. Berlin, you're going to be very busy next week. Please drive careful. Um, but if people wanted to, you know, reach out to you and ask if they you need any more help or, uh, you know, find out the list of speakers for your mental health workshop, how would they go about doing so? So you can go to derbycon.com slash wellness and find all of our stuff there. Nice. Um, I think they may have put our schedule or will be putting our schedule soon in with the rest of the schedule. Okay. Um, for the speakers, um, now that we don't have to share the uh, uh, room with the resume workshop, we moved a couple of our speakers to Saturday. I mean, sorry, to Friday. Okay. Um, so I will pretty much just be in that room <laughs> uh, all three days. So you can come find me there. Um, nice. Because I, yeah, I probably won't leave other than to give my own talk. Okay. Uh, and on Twitter or our Slack at InfoSister, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R. 
Nice. Okay. Mr. Betcher, you're going to be sitting with me at the table at some point uh, during DerbyCon, uh, along with the other developer person that I didn't realize you guys had, but, you know, apparently you're now a group of three folks uh, at IMF Ooh. Security and Log LogMD. Uh, how, if people wanted to find you at DerbyCon, other than in the Slack, how would they go about finding you? At DerbyCon? Yeah, I'll be around the booth. Okay. Um, and... You can hit me up on Twitter at Betcherponed. And uh, Amanda, what's your CB handle? Maybe I can catch you on CB while you're driving. Or <laughs> breaker, breaker, one man. What's your 28 over? <laughs> I don't think there'll be room for a CB in the SUV. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm, uh, so I'm picking up, I don't know if you guys have met Click before. He does stuff with Tool. Uh-uh. Um, he kind of lives near you, Brian. Really? In, in, okay. In, Okay. Or he lives in Oregon. Okay, so good news. Uh, the blue. I, I actually looked up the floor plan for the Marriott, uh, oh. the first and second levels. Bluegrass one and two is right by the Skywalk to the convention center. I mean, it's literally oh. you turn left and you're going over the Skywalk right over to the Marriott. So uh, we're apparently the table as we talked before the podcast. It's or, or during the podcast. It's right next to the bathrooms in the uh, the hotel. Um, we're probably all going to be really close to one another, next to the Rose and the awesome. Philly rooms. Uh, so yeah, there's, uh, yeah, fairly easy to get into. So, um, yeah, come find uh, bluegrass one and two right next to the, the convention centers, uh, the, the tunnel that goes between the Marriott and, um, the Hyatt where the DerbyCon used to be, um, me and Mr. Betcher are staying at the Hyatt. So that'll be nice and a quick walk over. So, <clears throat> all right, cool. Yay. Yay! So uh, we just passed 1,500 users on our Slack channel. With uh, We have roughly 450 active users. And um, according to our metrics, thanks to Miss Megan uh, Roddy, uh, about 200 uh, unique users per day coming in to talk. So we have a lot of channels, a lot of people doing a lot of things. We, have, uh, we just started an Asia-Pacific channel. So if you are in the Asia-Pacific region, which includes what? Australia... <laughs> APAC. I started it because really? uh, Joe, who's in China, uh, not China, but in Japan, he wanted to have something. That's um, great. So uh, if you're in the Asia Pacific region and you want to just have a channel where you can hang out when everybody else is asleep uh, in the U.S. and talk to people who are um, similarly, um, you know, uh, similar region area, uh, please come in and join us. Um Book club just ended, so uh, if you are interested in joining the book club, uh, Mr. Mister Cybuck is uh, taking, uh, he has a poll, a survey in our book club channel for the next book. Uh, we just finished Practical Packet Analysis, uh, Chris Sanders' book. Hopefully we'll get to see him. Uh, what they're doing is the next InfoSec book I want to read and discuss frequently falls into this category. So we have a number of different categories, uh, threat hunting and IR, SIM and logging, cloud container and DevOps, pen testing, SE and OSINT. Uh, looks like the front runner right now is SE and OSINT, which means we may, I'm hoping, do Chris Hadnagy's book. Uh, may or may not. I don't know. Once mm -hmm. we figure out what topic we want to do it on we'll probably break it down by books but uh dave is wanting to start that probably after halloween so after uh, uh probably november 1st so it meets every other week and we they try to do like a chapter every other week uh, uh which is different than the summer reading program we did so uh <clears throat> The Sim Club. So we have a Sim meeting group. So people who deal with Sims and logging and log analysis and threat analysis using the logs and the things. Uh, apparently, it's fairly very active. They had uh, 15, 20 people, I think, show up on the last one. And uh, they set it for an hour, but everybody wanted to go for like longer. So it was almost like two hours for that. But a lot of folks in there, a lot of some very smart people talking about, you know, what worked for them and their logs and their sims and uh, log analysis uh, systems. So uh, if you're interested in that again, you know, send us a DM on BreakSec or uh, join us at bds.podcast at gmail.com. Uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, thank you to our patrons. Thanks to you. Um, uh, you know, we have hosting and logging of, of our podcast and, you know, we can find our metrics like this. Uh, the Slack doesn't cost us anything, but you know, if it did, we need about $4,000 a month to be able to handle that. So if, uh, nice. you know, yeah, 
yeah, it's by active users, not all accounts. So, um, yeah, well, we the, did make quite a few active when I did at channel. That's you, yeah. Some people definitely perked up. Um, like, oh, right, Slack yes, channel. That's right, break sec. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, appreciate uh, appreciate all of our our patrons and people who uh, you know put a little some in the tip jar so that uh, you know we can you know, do what, do what it is we need to do to, to build our community and make it awesome here. So even, even so much as a dollar is enough to, to help us out with uh, hosting and uh, uh, the zoom that we're using right now, as a matter of fact, costs $15 a month. I'll be completely transparent. It costs $15 a month, no matter how much we use it. So it's, uh, it's one of those things that uh, if you join our Slack, you have access to a, a zoom that you can use to collaborate or talk to people. Um, as little as a dollar a month can help your local podcaster <laughs> yeah that's right support your local podcasters that's right <laughs> think globally act locally or whatever <laughs> so um yeah uh i'm i'm done for the week it's uh we've gone way over our time so uh find us on itunes apple podcasts i uh, a- uh google podcasts iTunes, iHeartRadio, leave some feedback on your favorite platform and let them know you enjoy the show because it uh, helps us get more exposure. And uh, if you're going to DerbyCon, please travel safely and we will see you there. So this is uh, it for Breaking Down Security. Uh, The next show you might hear will be either us doing uh, our private podcast uh, or uh, it's not private, but our break sec podcast with our fans. So it might get a little noisy, a little raucous. Uh, And we'll try to do a podcast with podcasters. And then I'm going to Europe. So y'all. Me too. I'm out. No. um, Me too. What? What? I'm going I'm going to Dash Fest in November. Oh wow. Okay. I'm doing the mental health workshop there too. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Um yep. Yeah, while I'm gone, we're going to have the fillers, the 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 DerbyCon audio and stuff, and we're going to have some real content. I'm going to task Mr. Betcher and Miss Berlin with actually doing some of that um, and uh, seeing if we can't get a hold of some of the speakers and whatever. And I've got uh, I've got Miss uh, Wendy no- uh, Knox Everett on the hook for email security interview that I've got to do with her before I go to Europe. So we'll definitely have that while I'm gone, uh, hopefully. So there's uh, plenty of content to keep you all busy and uh, listening. And if you see me in Europe uh, on the Danube, you know, put up your banners or, you know, (laughs) bring your babies out and I'll kiss them for you or whatever. I don't know. And uh, so, yeah, Uh, this is it for breaking down security this week. Travel safely. Be nice to one another. And we'll talk to you again real soon. Bye bye. Bye.